And I'm president of the European Central Bank, dear members of the European League for Economic Cooperation, colleagues, friends, students. It is a, it is a great pleasure and a great honor today to welcome Christine Lagarde to HSC Paris. Not only because, madame, you're certainly a, a vibrant role model for many of our alumni and students, but it's also because at HSC, a place where we value excellence, diversity, curiosity, and responsibility, we aim at being a, a place of high-quality debates, a place where we learn, a place where we share insights, and we allow to express diverse opinions, as long as they respect human beings. So thank you very much, very, very much for having accepted our invitation. I now leave the floor to Olivier Klein. He's a CEO of a large French bank. He's a professor at HEC, and he co-heads the HEC economic major. Olivier, do you, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Loïc. Madam President of the European Central Bank, dear Christine, members of the European League for Economic Cooperation, dear professors, dear students, dear guests, and friends. A lot of us are on the web now, but uh, it will be okay. As the president of the French section of the European League for Economic Cooperation, it's a great honor for me to hold this conference in your company, Madam President. And I would like to thank Eloïc Perrache, the CEO of HEC Paris Group, and HEC for co-organizing this event. The European League for Economic Cooperation is an independent international advocacy group that aims to promote European integration. France, Europe, and the world have been facing with a major public health crisis. In such a particular period in the history of mankind, the European Central Bank is playing a key role in enabling us to emerge from the recession this crisis has triggered. The ECB has remarkably helped to support the sovereign corporate bank nexus. The risk of a doom loop has been kept at distance thanks to, ver to the very fast and efficient monetary policy of central banks. Economic policies have efficiently stabilized the patient, if I can say so, in our country's economies. Eloric Perrache and I thought it would be fascinating to hear your thoughts on the role of the euro and European economic policy in this fast-changing world, and how the ECB will act during the recovery phase. There is no doubt that we are familiar with your career, Madame President. I hope, nevertheless, you will allow me to outline it very briefly. A talented lawyer in the Paris bar and a partner in a large US law firm, you returned to France in the mid-2000s. To begin your political career as trade minister, before being appointed Minister of, the, of Agriculture, and then Minister for Economic Affairs, Affairs Finance and Employment, um, where you held for four years. You took over Managing Director of the IMF, where you stayed from 2011 to 2019, before again returning to Europe as president of our, of our European Central Bank. How fortunate we are to have you with us today, Madam President. We can only be inspired by your career in which you have so successfully taken on responsibilities in the private and public sector at the highest levels. We are all looking forward to hearing what you have to say Again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Well, thank you so much to uh, both of you, and uh, good afternoon to all those who are physically present in, in this room. And I'm delighted that there are some of you, and I apologize 
uh, if we have been so strict in our security restrictions when organizing this from the ECB perspective, which I was not aware of. So I'm pleased that there are some of you here. And I would also like to welcome and salute all those who are remotely and, uh, and virtually with us. But we are delighted that, uh, that we are all here together. So thank you very much for having me. And uh, I hear that I'm the, uh, the, 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 the sort of first episode of this new series, uh, which, which I'm quite happy about, the Ashusi Talks Lecture Series. And I'm delighted to hear that as you honor curiosity and diversity, I can be one of the standard setters of both curiosity and diversity. So thank you very much for that. I thought what I would, I would do with, uh, with you is say a few words about the economic situation as we see it at the moment, looking at it from the perspective of the central banker uh, for the euro area that I have become two years ago, uh, right before the COVID crisis um, hit us, and then open a little bit uh, the windows to what comes next and uh, what should we be uh, attentive to going forward. So if that's okay with you, I'll, I'll deal with that in a matter of 10 minutes or so, and then I'll be quizzed by uh, two of your colleagues, uh, students, who've been very prepared, as I understand, so uh, we'll have a good time together, and then anybody who asks questions from here or online, I think, uh, should be welcome. And if I know the answer, I'll give you the answer. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. So. Turning to the situation um, at the moment, I, I was trying to capture a way for us to remember. And I would use the, you know, we are back from the brink, but we're not out of the woods. And by that, I mean that having suffered, you know, one of the worst possible crises, and a crisis like no other crisis, uh, inflicted by the pandemic and then sort of channeling into uh, our economies. We are now in a situation, certainly in the euro area, where the recovery is clearly underway and probably more so and faster so than we had anticipated only six months ago. Uh, for those of you who follow the uh, uh, European Central Bank uh, projections, uh, you will have noted that we have significantly upgraded uh, our projections going forward for growth uh, and uh, for inflation, because those are two parameters that we are that are critical for us, and uh, we are now looking at a growth of five percent for the euro area and inflation uh, of two point two percent. So on both accounts, it's much more than what we had anticipated in December and then later on in March and again in June. So we kept upgrading our projections going forward. And that is closely related to something that has nothing to do with economics, but that has to do with the vaccination. And while fiscal policies and monetary policies um, joining hands and really being extremely active early on in the process, no later than March, the, the second and third weeks of March, where the critical time at the moment, at the time in 2020, now a lot of the better news than anticipated has to do with the vaccination process. In the Euro area, more than 70% of the over 12 years of age population is, if not completely vaccinated, certainly has had their first jab, and that has had a massive impact on how the economies have uh, reacted, how lockdown measures have been lifted, how containments have been reduced, and how actually the portion of the economy that had been most affected, that is the service part of our economy, has rebounded and has almost returned to where we were pre-pandemic. That's another item that we have actually uh, also updated. While back in December we assumed that our economies from the euro area would be back to pre-pandemic uh, status. Well, now we think that before the end of 21, so we thought it would be mid-22, possibly second quarter of 22, where we would have closed that gap and returned to pre-pandemic uh, situation. Well, instead of mid-22, we believe that before the end of 21, we will be at the euro area level back to the pre-pandemic moment. We're not back to trend of growth that we had anticipated then, but we are back to uh, the level uh, of growth that we had at the time. Now, how did we manage that and how should that uh, you know, evolve over time? What we've done is preserve the situation, 
preserve the economy, secure it as much as was possible. And different tools were used. Uh, what is very characteristic of what has happened this time around compared with the uh, great financial crisis of 2008-9 and Secretur is that it went fast, it went big, and it went together. What do I mean by that? It went fast at the time when lockdown measures were eventually decided, the European Central Bank overnight, at my kitchen table actually, I have to say, put together a twofold massive plan to respond, to make sure that we did not have fragmentation, to make sure that liquidity flew in the system, which was being frozen, and to make sure that households, companies could have access to financing and loans. So that precipitated a measure that, as I said, went quickly and went big. Uh, nobody at the time expected that the programs that we put in place over time increased, of course, on a couple of occasions, would reach over 1,875 billion euros of purchases of assets. And nobody expected that we would put 2.2 trillion euros of financing under a special program uh, called the uh, Targeted Longer Financing Operations. So, fast, big, and together, because contrary to what happened in 2008, where the monetary policy was out there trying and, and, and you know, pushing borders and trying to uh, do what it could or what it takes, as my predecessor said famously, and where fiscal was uh, you know, not really operative and not as fast as it should have been, or more restrictive than it should have been too early on, fiscal went on hand in hand with monetary policies. And you had national response at the European level, at member states level, but you also had a regional response very quickly so I don't know if you're familiar with all that, and I'm happy to go, maybe I will not on this occasion go through what was done, but it was very much transgressive. We did things that could have been anticipated, but we went more forcefully and more together in that direction. So having preserved as much as possible, and just to give you an example, uh, in the euro area, for instance, Back at the time of the financial crisis, 2008-2009, real disposable income of families, of households, went down by more than 2%. And unemployment went down significantly at the time. On the occasion of this crisis, the disposable income of households went down by only 0.3%. So essentially, people didn't go to work for some of them. Not all of them. Some continued and took massive risks. But many people were on furlough schemes, chômage partiel and all that. But the disposable income didn't go down very much. And that was clearly a response to preserve uh, the economic fabrics of our society. So what we have to ask ourselves now is, what do we do next? And from having conducted sort of conservation, preservation policies, how are we going to transform going forward? And for that transformation, what policy tools will be needed? And I think that is going to be the story of our future, a story that you will contribute developing and building, and one where clearly the two key directions which have been indicated by the European authorities at Commission and at Council levels include green as a direction and as an imperative, and second, digital as a tool uh, that has to transform uh, our societies at all level. And as is often the case, you have to put uh, money where your mouth is. And for the first time, the European Union at large, not just the Euro area, but the European Union, put money where their mouth was. And they agreed a 750 billion euros joint borrowing program which they have now launched. Huh? The, the, the Commission is out there on the markets now, raising funds and very successfully, oversubscribed by a long way. But the 27 member states have decided to go to the market jointly together, to be jointly liable and accountable for that, and to then allocate those borrowed resources 
on the basis of who was most badly hurt. So not surprisingly, countries like Italy, like Spain, like Portugal, like Greece, which were more badly hurt than others, were actually and are and will be the recipients of more grants and more um, very affordable uh, loans uh, that they will use, not for anything, but that they will use in order to deliver on the recovery and resilience plans that they have submitted to the Commission and which are being reviewed on a regular basis uh, in terms of implementation. So that has been an, an, an incredible breakthrough because never in European history did the European member states decide to join hands and to borrow together, be accountable together, and allocate on a different basis than the per capita basis or the per country basis. So that will be the transformation that uh, we look forward to, and one where both digital and green uh, framework will have to actually dictate where money is spent. And I was quoted recently by David Rubinstein on Bloomberg to have mentioned that one of the three key challenges for Europe going forward would include, in particular, delivering, implementing, in closing the gap and achieving convergence between member states in the euro area and in European Union at large. Second, reducing the inequalities that we have. And third, achieving the green objectives and more than that we have set for ourselves in order to resist the most critical and the most terrifying challenge that is ahead of us. So I think I'll stop here. I'll take your questions because we might uh, say more in those questions than I would say in, in these uh, words of introduction. Uh, just let me close by saying that uh, I'm, I'm here to answer questions, but I would love to hear your views as well. And uh, whether you have particular uh, directions where you think that uh, we should look ahead in order to together uh, provide for a future that will be a little bit better than uh, what it would otherwise be if we did nothing. Because I very much believe that action is the way to go. Thank you. So. That's how the Germans always begin anything. So. Uh, so. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to everybody joining us today for the very first edition of ATC Talks uh, with our prestigious guest here, uh, President Lagarde. Thank you for being here and uh, it is a true pleasure to have you with us uh, today at ATC. Cristobal and I will be the moderators for the conference today. We are two members of HEC Debat, the student association in charge of organizing conferences in campus. We'll shortly begin this conversation with a few questions for you, President Lagarde, and then uh, we'll be able to, you, sorry, you, the audience, uh, will be able to uh, join the conversation and ask your own questions. To do so, you only have to write uh, down your question on the Q&A section of the webinar, and we'll try our best to ask most of them and to cover the widest range of topics possible within the allocated time. I will now give the floor to Cristobal for our first question. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. And thank you to everybody here. Uh, our first question has to do with women leadership. While women account for 51% of the EU's population, they only represent 19% of European government leaders, a third of the national parliament seats, and only 8% of the managing directors in the top European listed companies. What would be the best way to ensure that women ascend to positions of leadership? Is it through establishing quotas, education, or do you see any other way to do so? Well, thank you, Cristobal, and I really appreciate that it's a young man uh, who's asking the question about female leadership, um, because it's typically a question asked by women. So it shows that you care, and that I should say, uh, with its diverse commitment, actually cares about that. And I think that by doing so, it actually contributes to trying to fill that gap that you've identified. And um, you know, you've mentioned two of them. Uh, you've mentioned the uh, the quotas. You've mentioned education. Um, 
if we take each of the two, uh, quotas are an absolute necessity. And, uh, and I say that with, with um, open eyes and uh, the memories of the fact that initially I didn't like quotas myself. When I started back, way back actually, um, late 70s, I thought, my goodness, why should we have quotas? I should be taken from, for my own merits and I don't need any, any uh, um, you know, sort of alleviating factor in order to get to where I want to go. Now, it took me a little while to figure out that actually quotas were an absolute necessity. Uh, it took me getting to a partnership level at Baker McKenzie, uh, which was one of the most open-minded and most diverse international law firms in those days where typically women never made partnership. And when I looked around and I, I figured how long it would take for women to grow in, in, uh, in numbers, I saw that it would take 100 years before there was parity. So I decided that um, I had to change my mind and that quotas was actually a necessity. And if I look around at the moment uh, in Europe, there are four countries in the Euro area which have actually incorporated quotas as part of uh, the legislative um, framework. And in, surprise, surprise, in those four countries which have said we need at least 30 or 40 percent, depending on the country, of women in boards, those numbers have been reached and exceeded. So it shows that quotas actually work. Um, in the institutions where I worked recently, uh, certainly at the IMF and now at the ECB, we have quotas or targets, depending on which one of the two uh, we, we use. And I know there is a difference, but what matters to me is that we exceed or that we reach. And uh, I'm pleased to say that we have exceeded targets at the ECB at managerial level. Uh, we are uh, way up from the initial target that had been set and we're going to set more targets. And I think it needs to be done in a very granular way so that we don't say proudly, oh, we have 50% women. It's close to the 51%. But then if you sort of analyze and, and uh, go into a more granular um, uh, review of where the women are, then you see very quickly that they are at the lower end uh, of, of the hierarchy and very few at the top. So it's, it's by segments that you have to identify quotas. Second, education. Absolutely vital and key in all economies. Uh, not just in the advanced economies where you will hear, particularly uh, out of the US, the concern of STEM studies uh, for, for girls and for women. It's also uh, being, being, that story is being told here as well in Europe, also, although more recently. And that, that's absolutely necessary. I think it's also vital, and I, I, I draw from my eight years at the International Monetary Fund, to just remind ourselves that in terms of education, girls are generally, in low-income countries and developing countries, deprived of education. They simply do not have access to education, let alone university. But they generally are the first ones where the poverty level is, is high to be told that they're staying home and they're going to help uh, the mother. So the focus has to be um, on education, but the spectrum has to be as broad as possible and include all countries. I mean, you, come, you partly come from Mexico. Mexico is a case in point where young women do not necessarily have enough access to education. You have a fantastic level of education at a certain level. But in other, other areas, it's, it's much more complicated. And I think that we need, we need to really pay attention to that. I think there are multiple other things. Role models are key. If you don't, if, I mean, sometimes I greet my teeth and smile, as I was told way back when I was on the synchronized swimming national team. But sometimes, you know, I would like to say, woof, life might be easier if I just stop doing what I'm doing. And it's very often the case that then I hear young women say, you have been my role model. And I greeted my teeth and continued my study and I'm working hard and I want to get somewhere because I'm looking at what you've done. So f for them, I just have to carry on. And uh, role models do play uh, a critical uh, role in, in that challenge that we have, which is a huge gap. It's a gap in compensation, it's a gap in everything. Anyway, we could talk forever about that. Thank you, Madame Lagarde, that's a very inspiring answer. Yeah, and I think you're a role model for many here, at least for me. <laughs> um, to, to continue with another question, maybe on your mandate at the ECB, 
So in 2011, you became the first woman, indeed, uh, to head the International Monetary Fund. And less than one year later, you faced the 2012 European debt crisis. How did that experience help your decision-making process as president of the ECB during the COVID-19 uh, crisis? You know, first of all, my life is about navigating from crisis to crisis. <laughs> because, you know, when I joined the Bercy, the Ministry of Economy and Finance, in 2007, well, one year later, we had Lehman Brothers. And, 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 and then I joined the IMF in 2011, and in the August of, August of 2011, we started having the, uh, uh, the, the European sovereign debt crisis showing its, its face. Uh, and then I go to the ECB and COVID arrives. So my husband said to me, don't go anywhere after that. You know, we don't need another crisis. It's OK. Um, but I think having navigated the, the financial crisis of 2008 uh, actually helped me a lot in dealing with COVID. And, uh, and, and I knew that we did not have the luxury of time. We did not have the, the luxury of going slowly. We could not afford to procrastinate. And we, we had to really uh, give, a, a, as I said, fast, big, and together response. And uh, that, that, that's the, the, the key learning. I think the second learning was uh, that we had to focus on, on, on people. And that is something that I think was reflected uh, in, in the way in which programs were structured. Uh, when you look at, at those um, support programs that were put together at the European level, when you look at the SURE program, which was a complement to the unemployment benefits that were available in Europe, for instance, you can tell that the focus was not on, on keeping uh, enterprises afloat. It was not on, on, on keeping the banking system as, as, as well as it could be, as clearly was a focus in 2008, but it was on people. Now, if you look, you compare 2008, uh, 2019, in the meantime, the banking system uh, had strengthened and had uh, become much more resilient than it was in those days, and that was thanks to the work that we all collectively did in terms of regulating, comforting, strengthening, and making sure that uh, the financing system would hold. But we still had to take you know, very, uh, very quick, very unusual measures. Uh, when we organized together with the main central banks, uh, the Fed, Bank of England, uh, and, a f and Bank of Japan, we uh, organized, reactivated international open credit lines. That, that's because liquidity was, was becoming rare, and, and uh, hard currencies were in such high demand that it wasn't available. Thank you. Um, so continuing a little bit with COVID and what you said in your initial remarks, I would like to ask you, uh, how can we expect the Euro economic outlook to develop in the coming months? You know, as I said, back from the brink, not out of the wood. Um, and I think that we, given the, the, the state of recovery we're in, we have to continue to work hand in hand. Fiscal policy, monetary policy. And as far as the European Central Bank is concerned, and with the mandate that we have of price stability, um, we need to make sure that uh, financing conditions remain favorable. Those are three magic words, you know favorable financing conditions that have to continue being available for enterprises, for large corporates, for households, uh, for startups, so that they can get on with their business, they can uh, invest, they can have, uh, you know, we are now seeing, uh, and uh, Olivier uh, will, will say so on behalf of Bread, we are now seeing corporates coming for loans to finance capital expenditure, to finance investment again, as opposed to you know, building up buffers of liquidities that uh, they were short of. So we need to continue doing that on the monetary front. On the fiscal front, we have said that we believe that support is still needed. And as my colleague and friend Ursula von der Leyen said yesterday, we cannot repeat the mistakes of the past. And we have to make sure that the economy is uh, 
sustainable in its uh, uh, recovery and, and will, will continue going forward. I think where the difference will be is how that fiscal support is directed. You know, during the COVID crisis and the months after that, you just had to secure and preserve everything. We didn't have time to, to, to be picky and, and to impose lots of conditions. And in the process, you know, as Benoit Curé, a former ECB guy, uh, concluded by when reviewing uh, how the, uh, the um, le, le plan de relance, uh, uh, the, the whole support package had worked, in the main it has worked. And uh, now it's more a question of being targeted, of being focused on identifying what is going to increase the productivity uh, of, of um, all economic agents uh, and, and our economies. And that will require what I'm particularly keen on and concerned about, which is implementation. Because we are good at producing uh, plans, we are good at having intentions, but we need to be determined and persistent, persistence is a really important uh, principle, in actually delivering. That's what we need to do. Structural reforms, those that sometimes we consider difficult, we need to, to go about it. And, you know, the challenges we have ahead of us, turning digital much faster, thanks to COVID, we need to continue that. Suddenly becoming much more climate change conscious than we were before. Today, about 60% of the European population surveyed considers that climate change is part of the policy measures that have to be uh, uh, taken on board. So the reforms will be needed, uh, the focus will be needed, and the continued you know, favorable financing conditions will be there to help. Well, thank you for talking about climate change and uh, the digitalization of economy, because that leads me to my next question. Um, what role does European integration and cross-border cooperation play in the transformation towards a greener and more digital economy? I think, well, I'm, I'm torn between two things. First of all, I think that whatever other people are doing, each and every one of us, individually, um, structurally, uh, institutionally, and whatever our respective mandates are, must ask himself, herself, itself, what can we do? So that's, and we cannot have the excuse of, oh, but the others are not doing anything, so why should we bother? No, we can't do that. Because that's the story of the seven mice and the cat, which I have used in one of my speeches, where for the first time as president of the ECB, and probably for the first time, no, second after Mark Carney. Mark Carney from the Bank of England actually I took the lead on that. But I tried to explain and convince uh, colleagues who are not necessarily on the same page that we just have to do it. We can't just say somebody else will carry the water. No, 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 no. We all individually have to do so. But equally, we have to convince and we have to cooperate and we have to do it together. And I think that. You know, compared with 2008, compared with other um, projects, the next generation EU plan, which is the 750 billion euros that I discussed earlier on, earlier on has, has two pillars which have to do with uh, green policies and fighting climate change consequences and supporting biodiversity, because I think that those two are also uh, part and parcel of the same uh, uh, imperative. Two pillars, one because all the 27 recovery and resilience plans, all of them have to include at least 37% of measures that are actually characterized as green and will take into account climate change and will fight climate change. And that will transform our societies, let's face it. But there is money there, okay? Now the second thing which the uh, European um, bodies have decided is that 30% of the borrowing, the 750 billion euros, that the Europeans are going to go and seek and raise from the markets, 30% of that needs to be in green bonds. Now, we take great pride in the fact that green bonds are the fastest growing segment of the um, 
of the financing uh, projects at the moment. But we start from a low base. The fact that the Commission is out on the market through its intermediaries, as usual, to actually raise under green bonds significant financing is going to boost the market in the next three years. And you can see it. You know, it's one country after the other. It's one corporate after the other that are now saying, whoops, yes, green bonds, probably much better, and probably better subscribed, and probably better terms and conditions. But we're going to need you all, because we are halfway into this project. We are going to need smarty pants like you, who can actually figure out how we measure, how we anticipate, how we audit. Why do I say that? Because some of the bonds, some of the fixed income uh, financing instruments are there in various balance sheets around the world, not accounting for a key risk, which is climate change. So the European Parliament, thank goodness, has validated the taxonomy, and that is very helpful because we understand what, from a legislative pr perspective, is actually of a green nature, can be labeled as green. You know, you all buy products, and sometimes, produit bio, huh? okay, they're bio, bio products. It took a while for this bio label to be accepted, to be trusted. The same work needs to be done now. So taxonomy identifies what is green, but we are going to need a lot of uh, smart, um, statisticians, actuarians, um, artificial intelligence experts, um, accountants, and, and, and just good brain power to figure out what is the risk and what is the value of the risks associated with those products. It's not there for the moment. The second part, which is more difficult, which will require your input, is on the transition path. Because what we will be asking our counterparts is, okay, what is the transition path that you envisage in order to be net zero from a climate change perspective in 2050? And of course, there'll be plenty of very smart consultants who will put together very super duper PowerPoints that will describe that transition. But it will require some even more super duper brainy auditors, raters, measurers of all sorts to say, okay, that transition path, path is going to get you there or not, or is going to get you there in 2060. So don't say 2050. That part of the landscape is not yet figured out. So think about it. We'll need you. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. We will now step to the second part of our conference when we will receive, uh, receive questions from the audience and from the people uh, in the webinar. Uh, just a quick reminder to the people in the webinar, you can add your questions uh, in the section and we'll try to read them. Um, so let's start with the first question. Uh, it comes from uh, Francesco and it says, did the COVID-19 health crisis shatter the mass treat criteria and more generally the European budgetary dogmas? You know, it, it showed us one thing, which is that uh, the Maastricht Treaty itself embedded a few uh, provisions that actually helped us along the way. Because the escape clause was used, which has been given us for the last two years and the whole of 22 as well, uh, a waiver of the, uh, the various um, fiscal criteria that Francesco probably alludes to. So the escape clause was tremendously helpful. It was in the treaty. The other one which was also very helpful is state aid, which was also lifted so that special measures could be taken, special financing could be uh, expanded in order to support some, some of our economies and some, of, some segments of the economy. Because one of the characteristics of this crisis is that it has been uneven in terms of, of damage done and uh, the recovery is equally characterized as uneven. You know, those countries that have a huge uh, tourism um, part of, of their business model, for instance, were more hurt uh, than others, as an example. And the state aid 
regulations being lifted authorized uh, governments to actually support those sectors more so than they would otherwise have been able. Now, going forward, uh, those criteria are going to be discussed. I understand that uh, the Commission will reopen the public consultation that it had started pre-COVID. I understand from Ursula that this is going to come in November. The Eurogroup will be looking at that also October, November, I can't remember. The Eurogroup will look at that in, in November. So the debate is opening. Uh, you have uh, quite a few um, academics, uh, quite a few think tanks, quite a few experts that are proposing various solutions, options of all sorts. Mm -hmm. But it's a fact that the situation has massively changed. You know, there's been at least a 20% increase in the debt to GDP ratio of most member states. Um, uh, without exception, actually. So the situation has changed. The response must, must also address those changes and take them into account. I don't know whether it will take a treaty change, whether it will take you know, the uh, uh, modification of some of the soft rules, whether it will be gradual. My, my assumption is that there will have to be a transition uh, back into rules because we need to proceed with rules uh, at the European Union level, uh, because we are 27 different member states and there is no one single minister, minister of finance. Thank you for your answer. Uh, continuing on the topic of Europe, a question from Javier, who is uh, president of uh, ELEC International. How can we assure that the needed structural reforms in the EU and mostly in the south of Europe will be conducted and implemented? Well, thank you, Javier. That's, that's, in my view, the most critical question. Um, and, you know, drawing from my um, international monetary fund experience, um, money talks, and you have to squeeze where it hurts. Um, so the recovery and resilience plans include a series of commitments on the part of those countries that are beneficiary of those um, uh, funds. And as part of the review process, um, there is a scheduled payment of both grants and loans that will be released in tranches based on the implementation of the reforms that are committed. So I think that that is going to be um, a process which some will regard as, as painful, but which is a, a regular, normal uh, contractual relationship. You know, I give you money because I trust you to actually deliver on the reforms that you're committing. That, that's how it, it will work. It will require political courage, and there are quite a few very courageous people around at the moment, so let's hope. Uh, I got another interesting question here from Sarah. Uh, President Lagarde, in your opinion, do you think developed countries have a duty to help developing nations in the education sector, specifically girls and women who are deprived from it? Yes, as simple as that. I think we have, we have multiple uh, duties vis-a-vis um, -vis developing countries and particularly the fragile countries. Uh, we have a duty in relation to the education of women. Um, that's a clear fact because it will, it will address multiple concerns. Uh, one is the better equality between men and women, and I hate myself for saying better equality. It's equality between uh, men and women. Uh, it's, it will address also the issue of demographics, and it will also contribute to economic development. Women are, are an incredible, uh, wasted pool of incredible talents. So, yes. But I think that the developed economies also have a duty uh, in relation to vaccination. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit outside my domain of competence. Um, but. I've said it and I say it again, I'm very, very surprised and actually baffled uh, that um, advanced economies or countries of the G20, for instance, cannot put together the financing that is needed for vaccination around the world. And the IMF came out uh, about six months ago with a plan which is $50 billion will actually be enough to vaccinate all people of the world. And I think it's, if it's not out of generosity, which it should, it should also be out of selfishness. Because if we are 
nicely vaccinated at home without two shots or three for the oldies like me. <laughs> and we leave, you know, 80% of the population of the world without the r right vaccination. We are taking a risk and we are letting them down. So that you give me a chance to also say that because I, I'm very concerned. And I hope the G20 that will meet under Italian presidency soon will actually address that and will give a, a yes answer. Well, you will be able to talk to your predecessor about it. Uh, thank you, President Lagarde. We have another question from Leonilde, uh, who has a question concerning the Digital Europe project. What is your opinion on this subject, knowing that you are very critical of cryptocurrencies? Oh, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Leonilde. <laughs> I think they're com two completely different things. Um, the only element maybe that they have in common is um, the digital aspect of it, the virtuality of it, and possibly, but not necessarily, um, the technological device on which they're built, which is blockchain or uh, distributed ledger technology. That, that's, that's the thing they have in common. But the rest, no. Cryptos, whatever their name, are assets. They are not currencies. They are highly speculative assets, which um, claim that they are different from what they effectively are. Um, they, for some of them, consume an enormous amount of energy in order to be produced. And, and the more we hit the 20 million limits, the more energy it will produce or it will require for the production of new coins. Third, um, I really think that it facilitates uh, transactions of a very dark nature. And when you look at some of the largest uh, Interpol um, findings, it's absolutely obvious. So for all these reasons, I'm quite critical. Yes, that's true, and I, that's okay. I know that I'm going to instantly get this wave of what a horrible person to dare be against cryptos. Well, so be it. Um, but if people are prepared to lose it all, you know, it's, it's an asset. Okay. But it shouldn't claim that it is a currency. It shouldn't uh, misrepresent itself, and it should not be allowed to deceit consumers. Now, a digital currency is something entirely different. Um, to put it sort of uh, simply, it's, it's a bit like cash issued um, by the central bank, except in digital form. And in our current um, consideration and thinking about it, which is in its inception and will last a, a bit longer, it is not going to uh, disintermediate. It is not going to do away with current um, banking and financing systems. It's going to be part of it, but it will certainly offer to customers of the digital euro, a CBDC, an alternative to cash, and one that will be uh, cheaper, that will be uh, more user-friendly, uh, that will facilitate uh, transactions in a simplified uh, fashion, and it's an alternative. It is not going to substitute cash. I think that cash will still be around, and some people are very keen and attached to cash. But it's an alternative which has, which has to be developed, because if a national central bank or regional central bank wants to be fit for purpose, it has to respond to the demands of customers. And we know that there are many customers who are saying, you know, I don't want to carry around banknotes. I want to be able to just use fiat money guaranteed by the central banks, but in a digital form. And that's what we are working on. And we have to work to the two big chunks of, you know, additional work where we need to, to really develop the thinking. And that is, climate change and how 
does a central bank contribute to the fight against climate change and protection of biodiversity? And second, how do we become more digital and, and more efficient and secure for customers? Thank you. Uh, we got a question related to monetary policy by Edmond uh, Alfandari. Uh, what is your view on the preferable level of interest rates in the longer run? That's a nice question, but I'm not going to give the answer. <laughs> I will simply say that um, central banks have traditionally, traditionally used interest rates as their almost single method of uh, delivering on its mandate of price stability, and that over the last um, seven to eight years, alternative uh, tools have been developed which are still being used and still being necessary uh, as as we are trying to achieve our price stability mandate. Okay, so maybe the question that would fall... The, one, the, the rate that I can quote, which is not the interest rate, nothing to do with it, is the inflation rate, uh, which is, as you know, um, 2% and no longer close to but below 2%, which used to be uh, the measurement uh, previously used by the European Central Bank, which we have now replaced with this symmetric 2% over the medium term uh, reference, and which is now our measurement. You just answered the next question, which was asked by Rafael. <laughs> okay, so maybe I will go on. Um, so you talked about uh, the two main challenges uh, for the ECB, which is uh, tackling climate change and uh, digital digitalizing economy. Um, so maybe a question about climate change would be a great follow-on. Uh, could you please elaborate on the EU Green Deal and the ECB's green objectives? A question from Linz Rose. Well, thank you so much for the question. Uh, maybe I'll concentrate on what uh, we as European Central Bank uh, are trying to do. And when, you know, when I say that we need to do more work and to, to, to do further research on those two areas, it doesn't mean to say that those are the only two areas that we are working on. It's obvious that monetary policy supervision of the um, financing sectors are two critically important uh, missions of uh, the European Central Bank. And those are two sort of additional avenues that we have to work on. But turning to climate change, what we have now decided as a result of our strategy review, which was concluded uh, in July, is to incorporate climate change as one of the parameters that we use and that we uh, analyze in order to define price stability and understand how we can determine policies that will deliver price stability. So, uh, some people have argued and have said, well, Central banks should only be riveted to their mission. And I say, yes, price stability. But it so happens that price stability is actually seriously uh, influenced by climate change, by the massive transition that will take place, and that it will have an impact on price formation in a significant way, either directly, think about you know, reduced harvest, think about drought, think about flood. Price formation will differ as a result of that it will have an impact on indirectly because it's very likely that member states and other countries will decide the price of carbon, whether they do it in, in ETS, uh, emission trading system, and or by uh, deciding a carbon taxation and its modalities, but there will be an impact that will actually have a bearing on inflation. And in the same way as I discussed earlier on with you, uh, the, the actual risk associated with assets needs to be priced in. And for the moment, we believe that it might not be so well priced in because there are price indicators that are not yet there because we're not measuring well and we're not disclosing enough. So for all these reasons, a central bank should be concerned and should include climate change into its considerations and into its policies. Now. Of course, disclaimer, a central bank is not the key actor. And the key actors will be governments, will be parliaments, will be regulators. And we'll have to decide on those issues of what is the price of carbon and how we determine it. 
and what kind of credits and licenses can be given and how is it structured so that it is not deceptive. All that is not the business of a central bank, for sure. It's the business of government, it's the business of parliament uh, to do so. And just for those who are following also what we do, we now have a, a climate change center within the ECB, which is harnessing all the knowledge and all the information and all the, the research that is being done between at the intersection between climate change and, and monetary policy and supervision. Thank you. Maybe you will take a last question, Cristobal. Sure. Uh, it's an interesting question about the future of Europe. What are your views about the very low birth rates in the European Union, particularly... Very low what? Birth rates. Okay. Particularly in Spain, Italy, and Greece. Should measures be taken to fully encourage having children, as it happened in France after World War II? This question was asked by Clive. You know, I remember a conversation I had with Martin Wolf from the Financial Times way back uh, concerning Italy. And we were uh, together at this uh, conference on, on women and how women should be encouraged um, to participate in the economy, how there should be programs to help them, and how parents, not mothers, parents, should be helped in those years when it's, it's really hard when children are small and when you're expected professionally to super perform. And I remember him saying, when you look at the southern European demographics, it's as if women were committing suicide on behalf of their country. And I was struck by that. And he said, yeah, in some of those countries, there is no infrastructure, no framework, no childcare support of, you know, good enough to actually help women uh, do what they feel they have to do, and also join the workforce and participate in the economy. So as a result of that, they just stop having children. And as a result of that, demographics looks terrible. So I think that um, you know, a side effect of encouraging and supporting parents, having childcare available, um, is actually a way to encourage trust in the future. And how do you actually express that trust in the future better than to actually have a child? By the way, this is not something that is being debated in Europe. Uh, at the moment, uh, my good friend Janet Yellen and uh, Pamela Harris are actually uh, lobbying uh, at Congress to increase childcare support and to increase the um, the stipends that are being uh, paid uh, to parents, and particularly to um, single parent families. Uh, so, uh, Thank you for your answer. Maybe we'll try to quiz in uh, one last question from Danny. Which actions does the ECB plan on taking for banning tax paradises uh, in Europe, such as Ireland, Netherlands, or Luxembourg? Well, this is a matter where the European Central Bank has you know, no power, no authority, and uh, you know, as, as much as I would like to stretch my mandate to include climate change, I think that one is clearly uh, in the camp of the European Commission, the European Council, and the OECD, and I have to say that the OECD is doing a, a really uh, tremendous job in, in you know, targeting some of these uh, BEPS um, issues base erosion and, and profit shifting, which, which have been uh, in good discussion and hopefully will give rise to uh, significant tax breakthrough at corporate level and between members, between members of the OECD. Well, thank you, President Lagarde, for this conference. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Um, before we close the conference, uh, Mrs. Lagarde, uh, would you like to say a few words to all our students here? Uh, in the audience. I think they've heard many, many words, so I don't have last words. It sounds like, you know, uh, the, the, the end of the road or the end of the day. And, and, you know, I think this is the beginning of many, many better things to come. And, you know, if I came back from Washington and if I decided to yet again take the risk of turning myself to a central banker, it's because I'm very, very convinced uh, that lots of things have to take place at the European level and that all the goodwill and all the support and all the energy in the world from Europe needs to be um, uh, made available at the European level. There's a lot of work to do, but it's an amazing construction. Um, for those of you who have grandparents who were in the war and who have 
seen actually the disaster of countries being at each other's throat. To think that we have lived in this world of peace and development and prosperity, with all the haggling and the, and the fighting and the, the, the discussions that we have and moving from crisis to crisis, it is nonetheless an incredible achievement and we have to contribute to that and we have to uh, be accountable for generations to come. You and your children. Thank you.